Um, without further ado, uh, we're going to talk about a pterosaur called the spotted dragon. This is how it looks in uh, the exhibit. So you've probably seen this guy. Um, wondered a little bit more about him. Uh, I haven't. It's so brand new. I haven't even gotten signs back for it yet. So consider this a preview of what those signs will be like. Uh, one of the funny things about this, this is a, a Maastrichtian uh, pterosaur. The Maastrichtian is the last epoch of the Mesozoic. So this guy was living alongside uh, animals like Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. It just wasn't living in the same country. Uh, Phosphata Draco is from Morocco. So this is a very anachronistic sort of a picture. Mimavasaurus is early Cretaceous, uh, about 70 million give or take a bunch of <laughs> years older than the spider Draco, but eh, that's where we have the space. And dang, doesn't it look gorgeous in front of that black? Uh, it's got about 20 foot wingspan, so uh, that's fair middling for a pterosaur. But it belongs to a group called the Ashdarkids. And the Ashdarkids include uh, some of the largest flying uh, animals ever to fly. Um, uh, Raise your hand if you've heard of Quetzalcoatlus. Okay, so all three of you. Yes, excellent. So Quetzalcoatlus um, is one of the largest members of that group, but there, there are some fairly small ones. Uh, and when I say fairly small, uh, if they were on all fours, uh, they would be about four to six feet high. So pretty big family overall for pterosaurs and really for any kind of terrestrial uh, so this, you know, Phosphata Draco is very middling, but kind of pushing that, that larger end. Phosphata Draco means that it is the phosphate dragon. And when we say phosphate dragon, we do not mean that it was like a dragon spewing phosphates to people. This is a, a phosphorus explosion uh, dropped by a uh, military plane. Phosphorus is pretty darn impressive. And you would expect that to see that from a dragon, but that's not what it's about. And it's not about you know, making one too many lemon phosphates and then going crazy and worshiping the dragon or anything. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you recognize this film, you know you're in East cinema and my head is off to you, but if you don't recognize it, go watch The Birds, it's awesome. Uh, what it actually means is uh, the dragon that was found in phosphate, specifically the phosphate beds of um, the late Cretaceous uh, in uh, Corriga, however you pronounce that, I think it's Moroccan, but it's in Arctic. Okay? And so that has to do with its uh, presentation. It was preserved in minerals that uh, were full of phosphates. And um, a couple of other things that kind of affect its preservation, it's uh, pterosaur, which means that it has uh, really really hollow bones, like it makes bird bones look thick. Um, we had a scientist here, summer lecture series in Stallings, and uh, he was talking about uh, doing prep work for these, you know, trying to restore them so that we can study them. And uh, he said that uh, the outer walls in some places are literally paper thin and very, very hard to deal with. Uh, so, I've never worked on pterosaur bones uh, myself before, uh, but I have worked on sauropod neck bones, and I can attest because they have sections that are so extreme for the weight saving that they have sections that are paper thin, and that is a nightmare to deal with. And so, usually when we get pterosaur bones, they're in pretty bad shape, and uh, you don't get a lot of them. Uh, the two pterosaurs that are represented here at the park by original material, um, which would be Harpacanathus and a new as yet unnamed species. One's a jaw, the other one was part of a top jaw. And that's it! And that's usually what you get. So we're lucky to get uh, about half the neck of Phosphatograppa. This is the holotype, which means that this is. Uh, the set of fossils that uh, more or less carries the name. Uh, that is, if you want to figure out whether you've got, uh, like, whether that fossil that you found is a 
is less fiber drop, well, you've got to compare them against the measurements taken for these fossils. And what we've got is the fifth neck vertebra in a series uh, down to the ninth. Not a lot that we can say about uh, Fasfaba Draco at, uh, at, at least at this point. And as you can see, uh, they're pretty uh, crummy. Um, but phosphates did help to uh, preserve them pretty well. Uh, they just get crushed like any other pterosaur out there. Here's a cross section of a member of that same family, the Ashdarpic family. Uh, I don't think this one has been named as a species yet uh, because it was uh, found in isolation, if I recall correctly, but it was preserved in three dimensions. And that is really, really helpful. So I'll show you a picture of uh, a second Phosphatodraco specimen uh, that was recovered from Morocco, and you'll see there's quite a contrast. But here's a cross section. You can see this one's still round. And if you look inside, there's this whole lattice work of uh, bones that would allow these animals to get really, really big, but still be really, really light, light enough to fly. So even though Quetzalcoatlus, for example, had uh, a wingspan of about 33 feet, so we're talking about in the neighborhood of a small airplane that you might see at like Optum Airport. It got about that big, but it weighed a fraction of that. And this lattice work helped these bones to be incredibly strong, at least in life. Once they get fossilized, then that kind of messes up their strength factors and they'll get crushed or they'll get distorted and uh, everything like that. Here's the second specimen, and you can see just how flattened it got. Now, these are not uh, big bones. You can see down here, uh, that's about 10 centimeter uh, scale. So one of those neck bones would be about that wide. But uh, that is enough for us to use the um, kind of the template for the family and estimate that it would have a uh, 20 foot wingspan. Now, this is a picture of an as yet, well, a cast taken from an as yet unnamed, as yet unpublished uh, Phosphatodropa specimen. Uh, now, I'm not entirely sure how they identified it as Phosphatodropa, but having helped to mount uh, this skeleton, here at the park, uh, some of those neck bones were uh, original material, and so if you have any sort of overlap, then that can help you to say, yes, this is what a phosphate rock would look like. So here's a tag, and it's going to be a little bit different from uh, how you see it illustrated most of the time, because uh, this is not yet published, very, very new, and it might take years before it gets published. So a lot of times when artists will uh, deal with fragmentary uh, taxa like Phosphatodraco, if all you've got is a neck, well, you make your best guess. And most of those best guesses are going to be based on uh, relatives. Okay? So it'll, when you see it illustrated, it'll probably look a lot skinnier, maybe a little bit more bowed at the top, um, and a lot bigger. But this is uh, a much better reconstruction based on actual skull material from Morocco. Apparently they also got a juvenile as well. So you, as you can see, if you go like back and forth between those slides pretty quickly, the shape doesn't change all that much. The crests get a little bit bigger, um, but otherwise it's pretty darn close. That's kind of a funny thing about uh, pterosaurs. Uh, some of the proportions didn't change all that much from birth to adulthood. And we think the reason for that might be because pterosaurs might have been flying since they were hatchlings, or flatlings, as uh, a lot of scientists like to call them. So you get a flatling just hatched, you don't know how long afterwards it would stay in uh, whatever nest it happened to be in. It seems like they could fly pretty darn quickly because their proportions were very much like an adult's. Um, unfortunately, we have very, very little information on pterosaur eggs. There's a great quarry in China that preserved a whole bunch of them from a much smaller pterosaur. And uh, we're getting hints, at least in the media, of a site in um, one of the Dakotas, I want to say South Dakota, uh, called uh, Tanis. And Tanis is providing some incredible fossils, including stuff like skin impressions, 
um, it's said to record uh, the day when the meteorite that killed off everything at the end of the Mesozoic, um, that's what they're, they're thinking. Now, there's a lot of publication that needs to be done with that, but uh, there has been some uh, done already. Apparently that happened in the springtime. In that quarry, they found a baby pterosaur still inside of its egg. And they were able to use computer imaging in order to uh, virtually prep it out. So the baby's still inside of its egg, but you can 3D print, or at least, you know, if you've got access to the files, you can 3D print the whole skeleton of that baby uh, in the dark. So relative to phosphate draco, we're starting to get some information about how these uh, um, animals were grown up. We just were right at the cusp of that. Like that was announced earlier this year. <laughs> and paleontology is not a quick science by any means. Th these are all silhouettes of pterosaurs and birds over here from uh, the very latter end of the Mesozoic. And I included this slide in part uh, so you can see some other members of the family, at least in silhouette. Here we've got Quetzalcoatlus, uh, no, that's Quetzalcoatlus. Um, you've got kind of a short necked uh, version called Quetzalcoatlus. Um, and I think that one's out of Transylvania, if I remember correctly. Uh, shorter neck, we'll, we'll talk about that guy in a little bit. Um, here we have a new species of Quetzalcoatlus that's a lot smaller. Uh, that's out of Texas and it's called Lossamy. I think that, well, have you guys ever seen uh, Dinotopia? Or read the books, they're awesome. Um, there's a made up species of Quetzalcoatlus and they're called Quetzalcoatlus skybacks and I dearly wish that they named Quetzalcoatlus Lossamy, uh, Quetzalcoatlus skybacks instead. But, and, you know, that is probably for the best. We don't want too much of the pop culture names in here. Um, a lot of these blue ones are from um, uh, Europe and Africa. Okay. So um, here we have Fosfato Draco, and as you can see, for the size range of that time period, uh, you know, a little on the larger side of the middle of the category. Okay. Um, this and the, these animals, so these two and then those three up there with kind of the weird things coming out of the back of the head, um, those were all um, pterosaurs that were found in the same environment. As they've been uh, exploring these phosphate beds, they've been pulling out new pterosaur after new pterosaur after new pterosaur. And up until this point, uh, some scientists were saying that maybe pterosaurs had gone extinct before the dinosaurs had. And this is clearly uh, a place that's contradicting that. Um, so we do, we do know uh, it cuts the from them, that they were on the way out. Uh, they might not have been on the way out. They might have uh, been taken out by the same thing as uh, what took out the dinosaurs. So um, here we've got like, you know, at least six species all living in kind of this coastal sort of environment. And when you get uh, some very similar animals uh, living in that same environment, you end up with something that scientists call niche partitioning. Uh, basically, that means that uh, their ecological roles uh, would be different. Okay? And that allows them to, to live together. So, you know, Phosphato Draco would not have the same survival strategy, would not be eating the same things, or have the same ecological job as this unnamed uh, Quetzalcoatlus like species. And it would be different from this uh, Tethered Draco, um, which some scientists say it might be an Antarctic, some say that it's a uh, relative of Pteranodon, uh, which you can see kind of flying up above you uh, there. Um, much more famous, but we've known about that guy for a long time. Uh, with Tethodrico, it could be a later relative of Turingodon. Um, some some of our distant relatives would be these really weird um, animals called night disorders. Um, and that that's what why these guys are shown with these weird crests coming out of the back of their heads. The Moroccan ones are Alcyona, um, Seamurgia, and uh, Baradactus. Okay. 
They're all members of the same family. We didn't get enough of them to see whether they had weird headgear or not. But Nyctosaurus itself, picture something that's not quite as big as that Pteranodon, maybe about half the size. Looks a lot like Pteranodon because they are close relatives um, in terms of general shape. But instead of having that uh, sort of crest coming out of the back of the head, picture it coming out of the top of the head being about six feet long and then having a very, uh, being extremely thin and then kind of like the mass of a sailboat having a uh, crest going out the back. Sometimes you'll see um, artists reconstruct that or um, picture that with a membrane between the two branches of that crest so that it looks like a full sail which is about as long as one of its wings. So like, I don't know, if you're a Star Wars fan, something like that, what is it, T-38, whatever, Luke Skywalker's bullseye and walk rants in or whatever. Kind of, or, or like the Imperial Shuttle. So a pterosaur would look a little bit like the Imperial Shuttle. Um, now I don't hold to that. There's not a lot of evidence for putting a membrane there. And dang, if you're flying around with something like that, a gust of wind would cause you to break your neck. So I yeah. don't really hold to that. But it absolutely had this bizarre crest that's just um, like as long as uh, its wingspan, almost, or at least one of them. Yeah. Half its wingspan. Okay. So we got three different members of that family. One that might uh, belong with pteranodons, uh, pteranodons and then a couple um, uh, as dark as Phosphatodrocco being one of them. So that begs a lot of questions about what their lifestyle would have been. Traditionally, a lot of pterosaurs are believed to have been fish eaters, and pteranodon is one of the main reasons for that. You find a lot of pterosaurs in coastal environments. Pteranodon happen to have uh, a bit of a throat pouch there, and so that uh, causes us to think that you know, maybe it had kind of a pelican-like lifestyle. Um, and its uh, beak certainly uh, echoes that. It's very pelican-like in a lot of uh, respects. I'm not sure how rigorously that's been tested, but that's kind of the default. Um, recently, uh, some scientists have been saying, well, you know, we need to kind of think outside of that box. Um, we do know a bunch of different pterosaurs having a bunch of different uh, um, uh, diets. Quetzalcoatlus itself uh, was thought not to be so much a uh, fish eater uh, because some of its bones were found in more of an inland environment. They figured that it would be more of a scavenger, kind of like a, a giant vulture. And when you live in the same environment as, say, Alamosaurus, which is one of the biggest animals to walk the earth, um, then you would uh, naturally have big scavengers. Uh, when Quetzalcoatlus was um, walking around on all fours, uh, it would have been about the size of a giraffe. So, not only did it have a long wingspan, it also seems to have had a very long neck and a very uh, long skull. But, like I mentioned, um, they found a sh something that had more of a shorter, robust neck in uh, Transylvania. And so, um, uh, this was put together by a couple of um, scientists out of uh, Great Britain, um, Darren Nash and uh, Mark Whitney. And for this taxon, I think they've got a pretty good argument uh, for it being more of a terrestrial predator. But at the time that it lived, uh, Europe was an archipelago. And that's kind of an unusual uh, sort of situation. Um, and with unusual environments, you end up with some pretty unusual um, animals. What they figure is that this guy was kind of the top dog, the apex predator of its environment, and it would spend most of its time on the ground, was capable of flight, but spending most of its time on the ground, it would be uh, munching on terrestrial animals, uh, like this uh, small iguanodonte, um, Zalmoxes. It would primarily use flying for going in between islands, and then it could set up its territory and you know, much away. But it wasn't going out to, to sea necessarily to uh, find its food. Um, but as you can see, here's another member of the Ashtarchic family. This is um, uh, Aaron Borgiana. And it has a very long neck and a very long beak. And 
that might mean that it had a very different kind of lifestyle. Uh, knowing what we know about Fosfato Draco's um, uh, skull design, uh, we can't tell you exactly what it would eat, but considering that and considering how many different pterosaurs lived in its environment, uh, including another Ashdarko, uh, we should probably expect that it wouldn't be this kind of specialization or that all Ashdarkids were just eating stuff that they found on the ground. Uh, it could be a good lifestyle for a lot of them, but given the variety, they probably had a variety of lifestyles and were eating a variety of different things. And other scientists since then have said, well, no, actually, the crossfire draco could have eaten fish. Maybe that, that makes a lot more sense for that particular pterosaur. Uh, speaking of fish eating, um, sometimes uh, fish eat you. Uh, this is another uh, pterosaur that you see here in the park. I probably shouldn't have put it in quite that sequence, but you know, talking about fish, um, uh, this is definitely a fish eating pterosaur. It's got these sharp pointy teeth that will intermesh. Great for uh, catching something slippery on the wing. Um, you don't know exactly how it was catching things on the wing. Um, there's a lot of argument about that, but. This is kind of an interesting fossil. We um, find a lot of these uh, gar-like fish um, sometimes alongside uh, uh, pterosaurs like rainbows. Um, and in this case, we have that fish actually caught biting onto. But obviously, this uh, rainbows a lot uh, way too big for this particular fish to swallow. And uh, unless it was like tearing it apart, not likely given the pristine state of uh, this fossil and some of the other examples that we've got, um, it probably was not preying on it. Rather, uh, there's another specimen that was found uh, of Rancorangus with the fish still in its mouth, which means that it just caught the fish. Chances are this fish got entangled with this pterosaur trying to snatch at the same uh, fish and instead got a mouthful of pterosaur wing and got its teeth stuck in the wing so that it couldn't get loose and they both ended up dying. So that seems to be the scenario that we're seeing here. I wish we had class auto drop those specimens as good as this. <laughs> Sometimes in paleontology you get awesome stuff like this and it tells you so much about uh, what their their lives would have been like but let's find a drop go we'll do what we can yay <laughs> we still have a ton of questions about these animals i couldn't tell you anything about uh what fosfire draco's flight capabilities would be uh the best skeleton is still unpublished and mainly all we have are those neck bones that we can really uh, get into a lot of detail with. Um, can't tell you anything about its nesting habits. Can't tell you anything about what its skin would look like. Uh, which is kind of frustrating, but eh, welcome to paleontology. <laughs> we usually get just a few bones and we've got to reconstruct the entire animal based on that. But, given that we have the neck, well, the head's on the end of the neck, right? And that's what you do when you're feeding, you're thinking, and so on with. Uh, that's going to affect how the animal flies, and so we can use uh, um, a cervical series, the, the neck bones, uh, to deduce a lot about what's going 